they are stealing from us. And I think we're just trying to drive that point home now by adding more roles to Haskell. So Pritam will tell us about how we extend roles in Haskell to dependent types. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so over the last few years, we have been trying to add dependent types to Haskell. We want to do this while maintaining the benefits of Haskell, uh, uh, the features which have proved popular over the years. One such feature is roles. And so in this work, we try to find how roles and dependent types interact with each other, and we in try to integrate them in this. So the plan of the talk is, since many people may not be familiar with roles, I shall first give an overview of roles as we have them today in Haskell, followed by uh, an overview of dependent types as we envision them in a future version of Haskell, and then I shall integrate the two together and uh, finish by sharing some insights we gained during the process. So let's begin with something simple. Uh, what is a type? <laughs> this, this question may have different answers, but one answer may be a type is an interface through which we interact. If it is an interface, we might try to tweak it a bit without changing much. In other words, we may want to redesign the interface without changing the underlying implementation. One way to do this is to make a copy of the existing type and then put appropriate restrictions on usage. In Haskell, we can do this through the new type mechanism. So a new type is a type that has exactly one constructor. It is isomorphic to the uh, underlying type. But we can put some restrictions on usage, and we can uh, then use it according to our uh, restrictions. Since it is the same, uh, uh, it, since it has the same representation, we may want to use the functions that we already have on the underlying type for the new type. So this is uh, the increment function. And we are just using cores to change the type from int arrow int to age arrow age. So at compile time, it tells the type checker to change the type, but cores just vanishes away at runtime. So it has no runtime cost. And we also know that Haskell has uh, type-directed type computations. We have type families. Uh, Type families can distinguish between a new type and an underlying type. So here is a type family, age to string, that distinguishes between age and string. Now, as you might expect, if we have both cores and type family, then we may land up in a problem. So what is the problem? So we may say, since age and int are representationally the same, maybe age to string of age and age to string of int are also representationally same, and we can coerce between the two. So then uh, we can coerce true to string, but that is completely wrong. So what is the chain of equalities that we have? We know that age to string of int is bool, and age to string of age is age, but if we also allow this middle equality, we land up in a problem. So it seems that age and uh, int, though they are same, they are not completely the same. So how do we visualize this? So I have an analogy for this. Uh, so do you all see balls of three different colors in this picture? How many people see? Everyone. What if I told you that they are all the same ball? It is just because they are, that some lines are superimposed on those balls that they appear of different colors. So it is similar, uh, like we have two, uh, though they are underlying, uh, the representationally, though they are the same, when we look at nominally, they appear different. So we have these two views of the types. And these two views correspond to two notions of equality. 
So one is the compile time notion of equality, also called nominal equality, and the other is the runtime notion of equality, known as representational equality. So the Haskell type checker checks at nominal equality, but we sh should be able to coerce between types that are representationally equal. So now I shall ask a few questions to make sure that we all understand these two notions of equality. So uh, obviously, like, uh, if something is uh, nominally equal, then it should also be representationally equal. So is age arrow age nominally equal to int arrow int, yes or no? No. Uh, but are they representationally equal? Are they the same uh, in, uh, during runtime? Yes. But is age to string of age representationally equal to age to string of in? No, because one is bool and the other is string. So we see that with these uh, uh, two notions of equality, we have got some grip over the problem. Now let us see what the type of coerce is. So coerce is basically coercing between two types that are representationally the same. So in order to use coerce correctly, we need to derive the right representational equalities. And for deriving the right representational equalities, we need to keep track how the arguments are used in the definitions. And for this purpose, we use roles. Uh, we have two main roles in Haskell, nominal and representational. So based on the two notions of equality. Now, uh, can you guess what should the roles for the arguments of arrow type be? The roles for the arguments of arrow type should be rep both representational, whereas the role for the uh, uh, type family, h to string, should be nominal. Now, we, th we can say that this program will be rejected by the type checker because uh, since uh, the argument has a nominal role and int and age are not nominally equal, this equality will not hold and therefore this program will be rejected. So this is an overview on roles. Now let's move to dependent types. So. Uh, 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 we know that Haskell, today's Haskell has an intermediate language known as FC. On the same lines for dependent Haskell, uh, we have uh, an intermediate language called D and DC. Uh, D is the implicit version and DC is the explicit version. So in DC, we all annotate the questions, whereas in D, we don't. So let us look at some of the typing rules of D. Uh, we have the typing type axiom, then the uh, uh, pi formation rule and the pi introduction rule and the pi elimination rule, they are all standard. Uh, and we also have a conversion rule. Um, and since we are working for Haskell, we also need to have coercion abstraction and coercion applications, and we also have support for top level definitions. So now I have given an overview of roles and dependent types. Now let us uh, try to integrate the two together. So to integrate the two, we need to extend system D with new types, type families, and cores. And first, we extend D with type case to model type families, and thereafter we add support for new types and cores. So type families. So in today's Haskell, we can write this function of type family with the type in type extension. Note the first line, the type instance g bool a equal to a. Here we know a is of type bool because uh, k is bool here. So there is already a dependent pattern matching going on here. But we cannot run this function. If we write this and try to run it, we will get an error. Since we system D is a dependently typed language and types and terms are the same thing in a dependently typed language, we can both write it 
and run it. So we write it in this way, g is equal to lambda k, this thing, and its type is given here. And when we evaluate g bool true, we get true. Here, k will get the value bool. Then we know we take the first branch, and a gets the value true, then we know it should return true. So this is for type family. Now let's move to new types. New types are this strange thing. <clears throat> How do we model them in our language? So one way to view new types is that it is a semi-opaque type. You can see through it, but with effort. So we say that a new type is a value at nominal role, but it steps at representational role. Maybe it's a bit difficult to get it, so I have another analogy for this purpose. So I, I, I will show you a figure and I will ask you two questions. How many of you think that it is a picture of a snowy mountainous cliff? Few people. How many of you think that it is a picture of a street art? So, I shall not reveal the answer, but, <laughs> but, but it resembles new types. How? In one view, it is a value, something inert, a two-dimensional street art. In another view, it steps, it is something real, a three-dimensional mountainous cliff. So in that sense, it resembles new types. So uh, we have these two views of new types. Uh, at, it is a value at nominal role, and it steps at representational role. So f to model this, we need to have a role-indexed operational semantics. We say that, uh, taking the example uh, we have, uh, that age is a value at nominal role, but it steps to int at representational role. Our value in our role indexed uh, operational semantics stepping relation falls in line very well with the uh, role indexed equality relation that we have. We generally have this rule independently type systems. So with this, we have modeled new types. Now let's move to cores. So coarse enables compile time coercions of representationally equal types, but coarse vanishes at runtime. Since we work in an implicit language, we have left the modeling of coarse implicit. In other words, we have this conversion rule. So if A is of type A, and A is representationally equal to B, then A is of type B. So in place of coarse A, we have, since we are working in this implicit language and we can work uh, with some erasure, we have in place of coarse A, we have just A. So this completes our modeling of type families, new types, and coarse. And this gives us system DR, system D extended with roles. So with this, we have proved uh, type soundness of DR. We have the usual preservation and progress lemmas with some modifications uh, to take into account the role index operational semantics. We have uh, mechanized and proved these properties in COC. The, it is available in this website. And um, it, the implementation in GHC is in progress. Uh, it is expected in some time. Uh, so let us now look at some of the insights. So this question comes up, is type an entity or an interface? Is it code, is it data, something that runs? Or is it, or is it like an interface through a specification through which we interact? We see that new, new types have this dual nature. At one role they are like data and another role they are like interface. And it, since in a dependent setting, types can both run and bo uh, they can be used as specification, a dependent setting provides an ideal environment for exploration of this dual behavior. 
In fact, the original inspiration for rules came from uh, the uh, encodings of generic programming in dependently typed languages. But it was implemented in a non-dependent setting of system FC. With this development, we have traversed a full circle and we have found that roles fit very nicely with dependent types. In the end, I shall summarize what did we do. We developed system DR, system D extended with roles. We mechanically verified the type safety of system DR. And in the process, we got some insights into the interaction of roles and dependent types. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks a lot. Um, as always, we start with a question from online, although it's a bit of a mean question. It's not a closed question. It's an open question in a way, because it doesn't it refers to things outside the context. And namely, um, there seems to be a THG proposal going on in the proposal process that's going the other way and is going to go towards dependent types while removing roles altogether. So what do you think about that, if you know what this is referring to? Uh, so. Even, I don't know what happens finally, but um, this, uh, so we had this system D and system DC before, so we have added roles, and uh, this is not the end. We are going on adding many more features of Haskell as we have them. Maybe another line may be getting rid of some things, but we are trying to um, extend it by adding the things that we already have. Okay, thank you. Let's take one from the audience. The new type feature seems fairly distinctive for Haskell and, and not found in, in other languages that I'm aware of. For instance, if we compare against ML or, or even Calk, we use abstract types for, for some of the use cases, it seems. And the other features, type families and dependent types, are already present in Calk, and th things seem to work out pretty well. Could you comment on, if you were designing a language from scratch at least, how you'd be better off using new type instead of abstract types? Um, so, um, so the goal of this project was to uh, take this feature as we have it in Haskell and try to see how it interacts with the dependent type, proto the prototype of dependent types that we have. Uh, if we don't want this, maybe we wouldn't do this. Uh, but the idea was to. Uh, take the features of Haskell as we have them, don't change anything there, and try to see how they fit with dependent types. Thanks. All right, another one from Anonymous. He was very active. Um, can roles be ex explained away by a final grained understanding of the phase distinction? Phase distinction? Phase distinction, I guess, um, mm. compile time versus runtime, if I interpret that right way. Yeah, means explaining. Ex uh, can roles be explained? Explained away is the hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are. So no, what I saw, what I what I think is because you have this two-level thing. There are many places where this two-level thing happens. So there may be many ways to explain this because this is like quite common. I have seen it in many places. Okay, uh, Phil. So lots of clever people worked on this paper. Um, instead of doing all this, you could get, just get rid of coerce, right? You can just write it out in full. It will still compile to the identity function. It won't be any slower. Is coerce really worth all this effort? So in, uh, so in our modeling, uh, in this rule, we don't have coerce. So you are saying get rid of coerce in Haskell, source Haskell? Sorry, well, I was suggesting, yeah, if we got rid of coerce, we wouldn't need roles at all. And so, we would free up some brain power to do something useful. So then you, you don't want new types as well? No, you can have new type, right? But, but now when you want to convert it to an it, you actually have to write down the constructor or, or the function that removes the constructor. But those functions are implemented as the identity. So. You're but not really you, losing a lot in terms uh, of runtime. You do have to write a bit more. Yeah, but you also want no runtime cost? Like You, you, you already have no runtime cost from new type. Right? The thing that needs the roles is coerce, unless I've misunderstood. Have 
Oh, map coerce would be more expensive. <laughs> Is it worth all this effort to save the cost of map coerce? <laughs> um, I guess you can go. So, you know, Oh. Yeah, I would say it is worth it because uh, like uh, while working on this, we got some insights and I think this insight that I got is uh, like uh, each type and entity or an interface, this insight is like uh, very important to me and I think like it is a useful insight. And I got this while working on this project. I don't know whether uh, this, uh, how much it's, it will be useful when it is implemented, but uh, even from a philosophical perspective, this is rewarding for me. All right, one last. <laughs> one last question from the audience from them. And I guess you can... Yeah. Um, so, if I understand it correctly, the implicit rule that gets rid of coerce, mm -hmm. it, it, sort of, it sort of renders new types a bit useless. So, I tend to think of Intrudes as being a way of encoding domain knowledge uh, and keeping it separate from the underlying representation so that users can't pass in something that's incorrect. Whereas in this form, they could quite happily pass in an int for where a meter was expected, for instance, and the coercion would just let it go straight through. Haven't we just lost something by doing that? Um, no, we didn't lose anything by... Are you, uh, are you referring to the conversion rule? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we didn't lose anything because it's just more erasure. You would have like, a, since we are working in an implicit language, you would have a coerce some proof, but we don't care about the proof. We could put some dot there. So, so you'd actually need to have the proof in the in the type signature. So, so we we have a, an explicit language. This is the implicit language. So, uh, explicit language will have all the proof terms. Okay. All right. Um, let's. Thank you very much again.